I'm going to put a picture up on the screen here. Let's go ahead and throw that up. Okay. <laughs> How many of you instantly this like conjures up memories? Wide World of Sports, ABC Wide World of Sports. For those of you who aren't familiar, it ran from the early 60s to the late 90s, usually Saturday afternoons, like after all the kids' shows were over. Boom, then this would come on. This is back when we only had like four channels, right? ABC Wide World of Sports. When I was studying this passage this week, this image and another one that we're going to look at shortly came to my mind. Do you remember the slogan? Do you remember the first part of the slogan? The thrill of victory. The thrill of victory. So every week they would, they would put this logo up and you would hear that announcer's voice come in. ABC's wide world of sports and, and so on and so forth. And then they would say, the thrill of victory. And they would have like, you know, a boxer standing over somebody that he had just knocked out or, or like, I, don't, I, I hope they never put soccer players on there, but maybe a soccer player or whatever. But, um, <laughs> And then, and then you'd have like maybe a, a gymnast lands like a perfect thing and the hands and all that stuff. Uh, the second part, yeah. agony of defeat. Now let's look at this next picture. Okay. Do you remember this picture? It's grainy. It's grainy. I get it. Try to find a picture from, this was 1970 actually when this aired first. But, so this is Yugoslavian ski jumper Victor Vic, Vinko. Vinko, yeah. How do you say the name? Vinko Bogatai. So this was actually the second time that day that he crashed. His first jump, he made it off the jump and then crashed, and then he wanted to go again, and then he this. So the deal is, Vinko Bogatai became the poster child for defeat. <laughs> In fact, this is crazy. In fact, he was so famous for 20 years. They changed the, the thrill of victory picture like all the time. But this picture, this, not picture, but this video of Vinko Bogatai crashing on the ski jump before he even got off, 20 years straight, they never changed the picture for the agony of defeat. He got so famous for being the picture of the agony of defeat that when they invited him to the 20-year anniversary of the show, Muhammad Ali runs up to him to get his autograph. This is true. Muhammad Ali runs up to Vink, Vinko Bogatai to get his autograph because he had become so famous for being the poster, the, the image of defeat, of the agony of defeat. So what we're looking at and what we've been looking at is this future war in heaven in chapter 12, in Revelation chapter 12. Last week, we looked at the origin story, some of the background of the characters and such, right? And, and this week, we're going to look into more of the events. But what I really see here is today, we're going to see the thrill of victory that we can experience, okay? And we're going to see what the agony of defeat has done to the enemy of our souls, okay? That's the idea. So if you wanted a little glimpse into how my brain works, that's how my brain works. Okay, let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your word and thank you for the truth we find in it. And God, I do thank you that you use all of our lives, all of our experiences, all of our uh, encounters, all of the things that we've uh, entered into and been part of, and you use all of that. It's all part of our story. It's all part of how you've shaped us, how you've molded us, and how you are shaping and molding us. So today, Lord, as we look into this, uh, section of scripture just accomplish your purpose today that's always the prayer god let your words ring in the hearts and ears of your people and any words that are not of you uh, god just let them be left unheard and forgotten in jesus name amen so i'm going to read revelation 12 verses 10 through 17 is the passage we're covering today and i'm going to read in the esv so if it's easier for you to just listen no problem there okay Verse 10, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you. O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. 
But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured out from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. We're going to look at the parts of this section of Scripture, and then we're going to see what are the principles that we learn from this section of Scripture, and then how do they apply to us? What is going on in this section of Scripture that the Holy Spirit wants to use today in our lives. So the first thing that we see, number one, if you're taking notes on the app or in your bulletin, unceasing accusation. Unceasing accusations. Revelation 12, 10, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before God. We begin this section of Scripture with the ultimate victory that that Christ secures over Satan. The victory causes this praise to erupt in heaven, right? Imagine this. All of heaven at this point had, had seen and saw Satan coming and going out of heaven. We talked about that last week, how he still had access. We looked at that reference in Job. All of heaven had seen him coming and going from heaven, and when he's cast out of heaven, there's this sense of, Finally, finally, he is not here. He doesn't have access. And then that causes the entirety of heaven to begin to praise God. So I thought about this. And tell me if you've experienced this. You're somewhere, a social setting, a restaurant, a shopping mall store, whatever it is. And there's a person making just a terrible scene just making a terrible scene and making everything uncomfortable. And now uh, we've given a name to that. We, we would use the word Karen. And Karen, if any of you are named Karen, I love you, and that's a beautiful name, and I'm sorry that that, that is what's happened. But this term Karen has begun to be used to describe somebody who comes into a situation and causes all kinds of disruption and turmoil they want to talk to the manager, okay? That's a typical trademark of a, of a Karen, would be I want to talk to your manager. The reason they want to talk to your manager is because they want to tell them all the terrible things that you've been doing to them. All of the ways that you have been derelict in all of your duties and all of the ways that you have been doing such a terrible job of everything. They want to get this person in a lot of trouble. That's kind of the goal. And then... They will claim to have authority that they don't have. They'll say things like, I'll have your job. Right? I'll have your job. But then when, however this situation ends, when the person leaves, there's this sense of relief for everybody involved, right? This sense of relief. Give me some room to operate. Satan is like the the ultimate Karen. Okay? (laughs) Satan is like the ultimate care, and I know that's a terrible illustration, but you get the idea. All of heaven, all of heaven, when Satan is finally cast out, when he no longer has access, just erupts in praise that Satan is finally removed. But the bigger part that I want to focus on here is what we learn about for us here and now. When we look especially at the second half of verse 10, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. These are unceasing accusations, day and night. And it's good for us to look into this. And when I was thinking about accusations, I think accusations can tend to come a couple different ways. A couple different ways. First of all, there can be accusations about us. And this seems to be what what we're seeing here, that Satan is standing before God and accusing us day and night. Maybe things like, did you see that? Did you see that? Did you see what he bought? Did you see what he bought? Can you believe what they did with their spare time? 
they let their kids do whatever they want. Some of those accusations are about us. Some of the other accusations come to us. And I want to spend a little bit more time on these ones. These are things that you may have heard, maybe audibly from people, or things that you've started to say to yourself. How about things like this? You're stupid. You can't even understand the most basic things. You can't remember anything. There is no way that you can understand the Bible. Why do you even try to read it? Remember Satan's plan from last week. It's just to keep people separated from the gospel. Just to keep people separated from the gospel, right? Everyone else understands this stuff, but you can't. You don't know how to pray. You can't pray. In fact, you don't even make sense when you try to pray. You can't even stay awake when you pray. God doesn't hear you when you're praying. Why would God hear you? And if He did, why isn't He answering? I've been watching uh, some of those true crime shows lately. Any fans here? Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Thank you. Six of you are honest. The rest of you are... Here's one of the things I struggle with in those true crime shows. The false confession. And I'm like, how did you confess to something that you didn't do? Especially like, they don't make true crime stories about like, somebody stole a a piece of uh, penny candy, right? This is not what people are confessing to. How can that happen? How do you confess to this terrible thing? And I think that it's pressure. Partially. But it's repeating the accusation. It's repeating the accusation. It's an unceasing accusation that comes at a person over and over and over and over. This accusation is repeated over the person and and made to the person. Repeating this heinous thing that this person is being accused of doing. And after a while, the accusation begins to stick to them a little bit. Begins to stick to them a little bit. And after a while, it gets repeated some more. And then the the folks that it's being repeated to, maybe they start to believe it a little bit. Just a little bit. And they say things like, "Maybe maybe I did do that. Maybe I did do that. These people seem pretty sure that I did. Then they start to agree with the accusation as they start to say, well, maybe, maybe I did. And they, they start to agree with it because they've begun to believe it. And then finally, that accusation becomes who they are. They become that accusation. And I realize that seems like a bit of a stretch, but, but I want to I make a parallel here Because I want to ask you, has this happened in your life? Has this happened in your life? Maybe you've never been accused of some heinous crime and had that accusation repeated over you, but is there something that someone has spoke over you, maybe even when you were a kid, that they said, that they accused? And maybe it's stuck just a little bit. Maybe it's stuck. Something that happened to you that you never told anyone about, that you've just come to believe was your fault, or that you were the one that was wrong. What is the lie or the accusation that Satan associates with that thing? Either that thing that was spoken over you, or that activity, or that thing that you have now become who you are. You've let that accusation or that thing become who you are. And the question is, what is the lie? What is the accusation that Satan associates with that? 
So I want you to see that this is the battle plan. I called this battle plan, this message. This is the battle plan the enemy has. This is his plan. We're exposing it. He is going to continue to accuse you and accuse me of things. We will all be accused of things unceasingly, day and night. It's great if he can accuse you of things that you've already accepted that are true as well for him, for his plan, for his battle plan. But even if they're not, these accusations are going to continue to come and it's important for us to understand that. We get to see that our battle plan starts to be unfolded in this next section here. Number two, I've called conquered with consequences. Conquered with consequences. Revelation 12, 11, and 12. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Now I called this, just this point here, conquered with consequences for a couple reasons. Satan's being thrown down out of heaven and it's great for the people in heaven. We already looked at that, right? That's wonderful. Wonderful for them. But it's a woe to the people who are on earth. There's consequences to this conquering that's occurred. And I'm also saying here that it's with consequences because this victory cost something. John is telling the reader, hey, there is a way that these martyrs that we've looked at back in chapter 6, there's a way that they actually overcame. It costs something. The same way that, that they overcame then is the way that we overcome here and now. And the battle is conducted in the same way, and it's not different. So we need a battle plan. Now these are going to be the A, B, and C under number two. A is blood of the Lamb. Blood of the Lamb. Like I said last week, last week I, I, I hit the nail pretty hard that you will be a casualty of this war apart from the blood of Christ. Right? Okay. It starts here. Jesus shed blood is the only access that we have to God. There is no other access. 1 John 1, seven. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. It's only the blood of Jesus that cleanses sin. You have to start with knowing that you are forgiven. You have been cleansed from sin with the blood of Christ. You have to know that. Even if, hear this, even if the accusations are true, you're cleansed, forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. When you've repented of that sin, you've received forgiveness. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is where we start with our battle plan. Letter B is the word of testimony. Word of testimony. This one is great. I love this one. Because how many of you realize, how many of you realize that your life is always a testimony? Always. It's always a testimony. Whether or not you like that idea, you want to be like, hang on, I didn't sign up for that. My life's not a testimony to anything. No, your life is a testimony. It always is a testimony. You're either overcoming through your testimony or you're giving Satan a foothold through your testimony. That's what Paul was telling the Ephesian church when he's talking about how do we live in the Spirit? How do we live this new life in Christ? He's explaining that our lives look different when we're in Christ. He's telling them, you need to live in your new life. Don't live in your old life anymore. When you're in Christ, you've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. You've been forgiven. Don't live in that life where you are not forgiven. Move into this new life. And he says in Ephesians 4, 25 and 27, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Don't give an opportunity to the devil. When you're operating in your old self, 
you are giving opportunity to the devil. Your testimony, when you live in your old self, you are testifying and you are giving opportunity to the devil. We know that sin, for the believer, for the follower of Christ, that sin has lost its power in our lives, but we talked about this extensively when we studied Romans, that it is still very present, and our own life experiences will tell us that. I get to hear a lot of testimonies. I get to hear a lot of testimonies of people coming to faith. I get to hear opportunities of what God is currently doing in people's lives. I get to hear testimonies all the time. And what I want to do here is take an opportunity to get really, really practical with you when we talk about word of testimony. The people that you go to school with should know you're a Christian. They should know. The people that you work with should know you're a Christian. They should just know. The testimony of your life should be saying that. The people in your car clubs, in your knitting circles, in your fantasy football league, and fill in the blank for whatever else you're into, they should know you're a Christian by the testimony of your life. It doesn't mean you're perfect. That's not what that means. Never meant that. If they already know that, if they already know that you're a Christian, just know that they're watching you. They're watching you. Even when you don't realize it. Because they want to know How does a Christian respond? How does a Christian respond when the rug gets yanked out from underneath you? What is going to be different? What is going to be different for the follower of Christ when the rug gets yanked out from underneath you? How many of you have ever had the rug yanked out from underneath you in some way, shape, or form? Yeah. And so have all of the people in your lives that aren't Christians. So how are you going to react? How is the life that you're living, the testimony you're living, going to be different? When you're faced with a decision that might be, maybe it's on the verge of ethical. Maybe it's on the verge of ethical. People are going to be watching. How does a Christian navigate this? When something's really appealing and it's, maybe it's on the verge of ethical. I'm watching. I want to see how does a Christian respond to this. When you get that bad phone call, that bad news, many of you know we had a family in this church that got a bad phone call Wednesday night. And their family is watching. Their friends are watching. How are you going to respond? And the people that know that they're connected to this church, they're wondering, how is this church going to respond? So that's the question. How are you going to respond? How is the life that you're living, that you're testifying with, responding? When we share and live out our testimonies, we overcome the accusations of the enemy. We just do. We just do. And we don't give the enemy footholds in our lives when we live that testimony. It's part of our battle plan. Letter C is sacrificial living. And obviously in this passage we're seeing a very specific example of that. These are saints that are martyred during the Great Tribulation that he's specifically talking about. They probably had a pretty clear understanding that having faith in Jesus was a death sentence for them here on earth. Remember these martyrs we looked at? They were folks that came to faith during the first half of the tribulation. But they knew what was coming and they lived sacrificially, putting the stake in the ground that they were following Jesus, even if that means being killed for it. Multitudes under the altar. Multitudes under the altar. But guess what? People are doing this today. People are doing this today. People are are in places and in families and in situations where when they put the stake in the ground that says, I'm following Jesus, many of them are killed or by circumstances changing, it would almost be easier if they were. And what I mean by that is they lose everything. They lose everything. 
before you followed Jesus, you had a family, you had a home, you had a job, maybe you had people that would help you, and when they claim Jesus, all of that is gone. This is happening today. And most of us will never be in that position. We just won't. We have to be honest about that. Most of us will never be in that position. But I wonder if the principle is why many of us also seem to be stuck in the same battles with Satan and have never been able to overcome those battles. Is it the idea that we look at the comfortability of our lives and we say, I kind of like this. I kind of like this. Do we look at security in our bank account or our 401k or our pension or whatever we have and we go, this is, this is actually pretty nice. I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty okay with this. I'm not really looking to change a whole lot. And we find ourselves in these same battles with Satan that we haven't overcome because we haven't lived sacrificially. We haven't grappled with the words of Jesus in John 12, 25, whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The way we overcome, the way we gain victory is to die to ourselves. To understand that there is an eternity to live for. It's saying, okay, Jesus. Okay, Jesus. That thing that you're calling me to, that I know, that I know you're calling me to, is more important than what makes me comfortable. It's more important than what keeps me comfortable. For the martyrs, this meant actually giving up their lives. That's what martyr means. It means killed for that reason, for that cause. That's what it meant. To be killed for their faith. And I called this subpoint C, sacrificial living, because that's what we actually need to be doing. That's what we need to do. To live in a way that our life is a sacrifice to the Lord. Now, if this sounds familiar, it's because you're thinking of those verses from the beginning of Romans 12. 1 and 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. By testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the question for each one of us is, how is that going? How's that going? What would be the equivalent for you to dying to yourself? In your life, what is that? What does that mean? Maybe it's, maybe it's a financial thing for you. Maybe it's saying, wait a minute, if I, if I give to the Lord, I am not going to be able to buy that thing I need or want. I always get those mixed up. Right? If I tell my friend that I'm worried about their soul, they're not going to talk to me anymore. I know it. I know how they're going to respond. And if I talk to them about my concern for their soul for eternity, they're not going to talk to me anymore. Maybe that would be dying to yourself. If I stand up for Jesus at work, you don't know the people I work with. If I stand up for Jesus at work, I am going to be alienated. And every day when I go to work, it's going to be misery. Misery. Maybe that's dying to yourself. If you're struggling with failing to overcome something, you might look at that area and look at where do you need to make the hard choice to really put it in God's hands, come what may. Because that's what these people who love their lives unto death 
loved not their lives unto death. That's what they did. The martyrs knew that their lives belonged to the Lord anyway. Their lives belonged to the Lord anyway. They knew that. Do you know that? Do you know that? Number three, I've called pursuit and protection. Verses 13 and 14, When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. So this portion is really a throwback to the last week's message. It's kind of an echo of verse 6 right, of chapter 12. Uh, but now we see how the pursuit plays out. Okay, that's kind of the little more developed. Satan has this realization, whoa, I'm out of heaven and I don't even have access anymore. If my plan is going to work, now I have to kill the woman. Because remember, originally his plan was to kill the child. And now he says, well, now I've now I got to kill the woman. Remember that woman we talked about in our backstory look last week in, in our origin story was Israel. The original plan was to kill the child. That plan failed. The goal was to kill the one who would fulfill the promises of God. Thinking back to Genesis 3. But the pursuit now is of the woman. If she's dead, there's no one to fulfill the promises that the Messiah is coming to. Okay? Okay? That's the idea. We see the protecting hand of God again in these verses, and he's always saved a remnant of his people through every attempt that Satan has made to eradicate them. We looked at that in our little rapid-fire section last week. He's always saved a remnant that demonstrates the protection of God, and it seems that this is in the Great Tribulation. We see those words of time, times, and half a time, the equivalent of three and a half years. We've seen this now in months. We've seen it in days. We've seen it now in years. John describes it in various ways, but um, the focus has shifted. The focus has shifted. Satan is after the woman now, not the son that she bore. He's pursuing her, but God is protecting her. And I thought back just to a couple weeks ago when we talked about how many times has God protected and preserved you, right? Even if you weren't walking with him. Can you think back over the landscape of your lives? Think of times when you've been protected or preserved. And it helps reinforce the idea here that you didn't just get lucky, okay? Or you weren't quite dumb enough in that thing you were doing, right? God was protecting you. God was preserving you. Target of Satan has changed, and he, uh, now he sees his target is expanding as well. We see that his, his target is expanding. So he launches now what I'm saying in number four is an all-out assault. Again, this is the battle plan. We're seeing Satan's battle plan. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to help to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. He stood on the sand of the sea, This is an all-out assault that Satan launches in the end times. An all-out assault. He's cast out of heaven and we saw that he knows his time is short. He's not holding anything back. It also gives us insight into the war that's happening right now. We started off this section with some figurative language. And we've talked a lot about figurative and literal as we go through Revelation the idea of Satan pouring water, uh, pouring water out of his mouth like a river is likely some great army. That's kind of what a lot of the commentators say. Uh, it kind of makes sense. There's figurative language there. And we're going to see some pretty sizable armies later in the book. And again, we're not linear, so we've already seen some large armies. So it seems that this would be uh, a figurative description of some large army. Massive armies gathered against God against God's people. Satan at this point is on like plan E or F or without saying the whole alphabet, I don't know what the next letter is. A, B, C, D, F, G. G, yeah. So some of the commentaries that you're going to read, they speculate this is probably what this is, but perhaps if a large army is being assembled against the woman, against Israel, the earth, 
Maybe that's some other countries that assemble another great army and uh, they support her and swallow up the army that's been assembled against her. Okay, I don't know. Obviously, this is figurative language. It's symbolic of something. Again, we've talked at detail about that. When we're not given the details, we're not going to spend a bunch of time trying to throw possibilities out there. Instead, I want to focus on something else in these verses. Verse 17, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. If you're wondering why things are hard, verse 17. Why are things so hard? Verse 17. Verse 17. Why is life so hard? Because Satan is furious and he's at war with you if you are following Jesus. He's desperate. His focus has shifted to the people who keep the testimony of Jesus. And I thought it was interesting. Remember, remember in our battle plan, what was letter B? The word of our testimony? So it's, even when we live for Christ, we experience attacks of the enemy, right? That testimony is the same way that the martyrs overcame Satan. It's the same tool in our battle plan that we use to overcome Satan. It's like a cycle. We get attacked. We grow in our testimony, which helps us overcome. It's like those old cartoons where there would be like the energy monster. And, you know, this little energy monster thing is, is here. And then, the, you know, they, they go, well, the only weapon we have is this energy gun. And they shoot it at the energy monster and the energy monster gets bigger. Right? It's like a, like a, like kind of like that, right? Satan's like, ah, I gotcha. And then we, we, we grow in our testimony because we've been preserved and protected through these attacks. Or our testimony lives on after we're gone about how God worked in our life. And so this battle plan, this tool that we have in our battle plan is actually being fed by the one who's attacking us. The enemy hasn't figured out that by continuing his attacks on Christians, he's giving them more testimony in which they overcome the enemy. We need to understand that this is real. We need to understand that Satan is at war with us. It's important for you to hear that. He's at war with us now while, we're, while he still has access to heaven as he's hurling accusations about us day and night. And I know this has been a little bit heavy, Right, as many of our sermons in this Revelation series have been, but I'm going to wrap this up with some encouragement. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up with some encouragement. We are not in this alone. Isn't that encouraging to hear that we're not in this alone? Thank you, Lord. So you can write these references down. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can write these down on the bottom of your bulletin or in the little. Your notes section on the app, 1 John 2, 1, tells us that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Satan is hurling accusations about us to the Father, but Jesus is there advocating for us, right? And, and not only is he advocating, but he's interceding for us. Read all of eight, uh, Romans, the last half of chapter 8, but verses 33 and 34, it's telling us that Jesus is interceding for us. Shortly before that, we see that the Holy Spirit is interceding for us. We're not in this alone. We have some other instructions to consider when we see the reality that we're in a battle. And Paul highlighted this uh, again to the Ephesians. He gives them the battle plan. And this is how we, this is how we tool up, right? Ephesians 6.10 and through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So read the rest of Ephesians chapter 6. And cover the pieces of armor. And <clears throat> we've had little cards here in the church in the past that we've handed out that help you to just kind of pray through those. 
kind of a short bullet point list, but you can make yourself a bullet point list. You can pray that armor over yourself every day. But for now, just know a few things. We're in a battle, and there's a battle plan for the enemy. Thank God it's revealed to us, which is helpful. There's also a battle plan for the follower of Jesus. Remember that wide world of sports analogy I started with today? The thrill of victory for the follower of Jesus is this now and not yet. As we walk with Him, this kingdom reality that we're, we experience the kingdom of God now and not yet. As we see victory over sin in our lives and we see, I've said it before, in our sanctification, that needle moving in our lives. Right? We never get there. We never achieve this not till glorification when the presence of sin is removed. But we see these victories over sin in our lives and knowing that, that Jesus has already won and that we begin to see that victory in our lives here and now and to a greater and a perfect degree in eternity. That's an encouragement to me. It's a big encouragement to me. And then there is the agony of defeat. The agony of defeat. Satan is like Vinko Bogatai, becoming the poster child for defeat. Becoming the poster child immortalized as the symbol of defeat. A defeated foe. A defeated foe, but he's not interested in giving up. He's not interested in giving in. The battle is not about our own strength or our own might. It's about our living our lives in a way that acknowledges the one who has already conquered. We just live our lives acknowledging that Jesus has already conquered. So ultimately, it's about surrender. It's about surrender. It's about surrendering my strength, my might, my agenda to the one who's already conquered to the victor. It's about recognizing who we are fighting and how we're fighting and that our fight starts with surrender. Our fight starts with surrender. And so, as I close, I just want you to think of that. I've, I've laid some pretty heavy things out there today, and one of those might be something that you need to surrender. So we're going to have the worship team come up. We have one more song we're going to sing. And I think it would be good for each one of us to just reflect during this song, to what is it that I need to surrender? Where have I been battling? Where have I been fighting? Where have I been, been working and fighting in my own strength and my own power? And where do I need to understand that Jesus has already overcome? And perhaps for you today, it's the first time you've come to that realization and you've recognized your sin that separated you from God. And in this, you're realizing that there's been one provision made, the shed blood of Christ. That's it. His finished work on the cross, His death, burial, and resurrection that we can just accept. We recognize the sin. We turn away from it in repentance. Receive the free gift of salvation. And then we engage in this battle with our battle plan that starts with the blood of the Lamb. We live a life that puts Jesus on display. And we live that life sacrificially. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for today. Thank you again for your word, and Lord, I thank you for these people here. Thank you that you've given us the, the insight into how this all plays out. Thank you that we've already seen the, the victory that you have already won. And Lord, we see Satan in the agony of his defeat grasping for all of everything that he can grab as he's a defeated foe living out the short time that he has left. He knows his time is short. And so God, we acknowledge that. We call out his work in and around our lives, in and around our families, and we claim victory over that through your shed blood, through our life transformed and a life sacrificed to you. In Jesus' name.